Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Bellingham Unitarian Fellowship. I'm Reverend Paul Beckel. Welcome everyone here on Zoom and everyone here in this room. As we come together and then again as we will go out and return to the everyday, we hold one another in love to nurture the spark of our precious lives we hold one another in love. To nurture one another's awareness that here and now we belong. For this, we hold one another in love. Good morning. My name is Stephanie Raines. Thanks, Paul. My wife, Lynn, and I have been members here for about five years, and coming here nurtures my spirit. This morning when I was getting dressed, I happened onto a necklace I acquired more than 40 years ago that I call my little prince. Do we have any fans of the <laughs> petite prince in the audience? What is essential? is invisible to the eye. The definition of spirit, and I'm wearing it around my neck. <laughs> spirit. Today, we are going to focus on what nurtures our spirit. Nurtures the spark of our children's precious lives. What, and what it might mean to nurture the flame in others as well as in ourselves. Doing art is one of the things that nourishes my spirit, and it is an honor and a blessing to share a few of my favorite watercolors with you today. This one's called Tell Us About Hope. I did it during the pandemic. Thank you to Jeff Copeland for bringing them to the screen for us today. together with the children now. It's a song about a little light. Can you all put your hands together to make like a little light? And we're going to we're going to do movements while we sing. Let it shine. 
Please say together our covenant. Now we'd like to sing two songs with Hungarian in them. And uh, the words are hopefully going to be up there. First one, Seke Aldash, is 1043 in the Teal Hymn Book. And it's, if you read music at all, it's good to look there because we have two different melodies that go along together. And you can see the melodies notated in your hymn book. And 1043, OK? That's the first song. And Carrie and I are going to do this together. Which one are you singing? I'm singing the Hungarian. OK, so we're going to start with part one in Hungarian, singing with Carrie. And then we will go back, and we will all do the English part two with me. And then the third time, you get to choose which one of us you want to sing with. <laughs> all right? Here we go. Yeah, let's stand, please. Now stay standing for one of our favorite hymns, first in English and then in Hungarian, Spirit of Life. So it's in your hymn books one, two, three. We'll sing it in English first.
I imagine how I might feel if my kids were still young, skipping out of the sanctuary while we sang, we hold you in our love as you go. Sometimes I'd probably be relieved that for just a moment, someone else would be managing all of that energy. <laughs> Sometimes I'd probably feel prematurely nostalgic to see them going, knowing that someday I'd see them going and wouldn't see them for a long time. And sometimes, maybe, when I heard my congregation singing that song, I'd tune into the words and I'd think, yeah, even as I'm letting them go, I am still holding them in love. And in doing so, I am not alone. Virginia asked a few of our parents what these words mean to them when they sing them and when they hear you sing them. Good morning. Thanks. Uh, my name is Erin Bonamy, and I and my husband, Lindy Everhart, we have a four-year-old. And so that's our day, most days. Um, when I thought about the prompt, I thought about one night this week, Gus just turned four. One night this week, it was a dad a night for stories and a mama night for cleanup. And I said goodbye to Gus. I said, good night. Starts walking up to bed and he stops. And he turns around and he says, I'm a growing man, mom. <laughs> but I still like hugs. <laughs> and that's it. I think about that. I think about, he already knows how to be himself. And one of the ways I can nurture that is remembering to not get in his way. There's lots of jobs that parents have, but letting your kid be your kid, that should be so fundamental. So I always think about how can I make sure that's what he knows, that he's wanted and he's loved and all those things, and that he's just free to be himself. And I realize we can't do that alone. One of the things we need is people. We've arranged it so it's easy to feel isolated. And one of the things I try to do is be here. Coming here has helped, and I thank you for that. Hi, I'm Courtney, and this is Elowen. She doesn't talk much. Um, <laughs> recently, my son did something, and he made a mistake, and he started beating himself up over it. And he was so upset, he had a meltdown. And so I explained to him that it's okay. He's still learning, he's still growing, and that he can make mistakes. It's how we learn, actually, is by making mistake, realizing that didn't work, and then changing. And then it turns out, I think, that the, the lesson stuck. Because the other day, he was getting in trouble for something. <laughs> <laughs> and he goes, Dad, I can make mistakes. Alwyn and I are still learning. We can make mistakes. And whenever I hear the hold you in your hearts as we go line specifically, I think about my role as a parent is to be like a safety net. So no matter how high they want to go or shoot for, they don't feel afraid of making mistakes and learning and becoming the best person they can be. And as they grow up and hopefully shoot for the stars, my goal is to always be there to nurture them and to be that safety net that they need to grow and make mistakes. Thank you. Hi, my name is Annie Sorich, um, and I have two kids who aren't here because they're doing park church instead this morning with dad. Um, for me, uh, when I heard this prompt, I immediately thought about how so much of parenting feels like trying to teach them how to be or just trying to get them dressed and out the door on time. <laughs> um, and that stuff really feels like snuffing out the spark. Um, and then I don't have a lot of energy left over 
to nurture the spark. So when we sing this song, it's, it's a good reminder for me that that's important. And um, like others have said, hearing everybody sing the song is a good reminder that I'm not doing it alone. Thank you. Thanks, all of you. And let's sing to them now as they go. We hold you we're going to sing let there be peace on earth I know that many of us are praying for peace right now and maybe all the time as we should singing this song together is a shared prayer the line about let it begin with me is the reason I chose to sing it today what can we individually do to nurture peace? Paying attention to our own sacredness and the sacredness in others is a powerful way to begin. Thank you. Thank you for singing it together. It just helps my soul. Natalie Johnson is going to speak about interweave, revising, reviving interweave, and uh, we are reviving the beloved community moment as we do that.
Good morning. I am Natalie Johnson, and I'm very excited to talk briefly about Interweave. For those who aren't familiar with it, this is the UU program to combat oppression of LGBTQIA2S plus people. <laughs> Just a quick announcement. This, this morning, right after church at 12, from 12 to 1.30, there'll be an organizing meeting for Interweave. We've been dormant for several years, and this is an opportunity to revitalize and get it going again. So I'm very excited. We had originally planned to be in the library, but it's full of the uh, raffles rummage sale. So we're going to meet upstairs in the biggest classroom that's open. So please come. We're looking forward to it. The piece on the screen is called Centering, and I need to take a deep breath to center myself before beginning to talk about this precious topic. So would you join me in a deep breath? I have a head tremor, and when I'm nervous, it goes crazy. And sometimes help, it helps to take a deep breath. I was an English and psychology teacher in the 70s, and later I was a high school counselor until I retired in 2000. It's kind of hard for me to believe that was over 20 years ago. As an educator, it was my life work to nurture the spark of others. It was satisfying work and also exhausting. Gradually, I began to see that it was just as important to prevent burnout for myself and others by learning and teaching self-care. That meant learning to let go of the idea that it was selfish to place priority on doing things that nourished myself. In those days, I advocated for personal days and meditation, exercise, massage, walking in nature, finding someone to talk to, etc. I'm guessing that you all have some idea what self-care is about. I still think that self-care is very important, and I don't think it's all that easy to do on a regular basis. <laughs> After I retired, I had the time to do self-care anytime I wanted, in theory. <laughs> and I didn't actually take very good care of myself sometimes. This summer, I was at Interplay Camp, some of you might have been here this summer for a service that Anna Matheson, Barbara Tenhove, and I facilitated on interplay as a spiritual practice. It's easier to demonstrate than to define, but it has to do with movement and accessing our body's wisdom. It's all about aliveness, and it's a fabulous self-care practice. I woke up from a dream after a day at camp, interplay camp, with the words of the song we've been talking about today going through my head over and over. Here's a pantoum, which is a kind of poem. I've been writing a lot of those in the last year. This is a pantoum about that dream. Nurture the spark of my precious life we sing this song to children as they leave for religious education. I woke up in the night with those lyrics in my head. What would it mean to nurture my own spark? We sing this song to children as they leave for religious education. Interplay reminds me to pay attention to my aliveness. 
what would it mean to nurture my own spark? Moving to music and making art are passions that have been important to me for many years, even though I don't do them as often as I could. Interplay reminds me to pay attention to my aliveness, not just at camp. Moving to music and making art are passions that have been important to me for many years, even though I don't do them as often as I could. I'm having fun doing art here, integrating it into an interplay weekend. I woke up in the night with those lyrics in my head, not just at camp. I'm having fun doing art here, integrating it into an interplay weekend, nurturing the spark of my precious life. In this time of so much suffering, war, climate crisis, deep divisions in our country, Connecting to our spirits, our resilience, our optimism could not be more important. What I have come to see is that we each have precious gifts, unique ways that our own creativity manifests in this body, in this life, and that one of the things we need to learn as we mature <coughs> is how to take responsibility for caring for those gifts and how to share them. How do we fan the flames of hope, creativity, How do we fan the flames of hope, creativity, and generosity of spirit in ourselves and in others? It will be different for each of us. And sometimes in our lives it will be easier than others. But I'm proposing that it's not an option. It might mean carving out time to paint, write, dance, cook, play music, whatever makes us feel fully alive. I think aliveness is a kind of signal that we are on the right track. And then we need to find ways to share those gifts with the world. Ideally, like here at Buff, where they're welcomed and appreciated. I'm up here today participating as a celebrant because this feels very alive. A little scary for sure, but exciting. Being on the celebrant team, collaborating with Paul and others, has been a place to share my gifts and to feel valued. Think about your spark, your precious gifts. What comes quickly to mind? When do you feel most alive? What do you do that nourishes your spirit? And who nourishes those gifts in you? Where and with whom do you share them? There will be time later in the service where we're going to ask some of you any of you who want to, to share brief answers to that. And then there will be coffee hour where you could share some more. But I invite you to think about this for yourself. Really take this personally. How do you nourish the spark of your precious life?
How did you come to be here now? It's true for me, so I'm guessing it is true for many of you as well. I am here now because I've been fortunate, because I've been nurtured, and I've overcome some obstacles, and I've found it rewarding to help others overcome obstacles. And I'm hoping for all of the above to happen again and again. So today I find myself wanting to say thank you. I'm wanting to remember with fondness. And 
I'm wanting to find the inspiration to continue to pay it forward. And while I'm at it, I'm open to a little more nurturing of the spark of my own precious life and a little more learning about how to do that effectively for others. We hold you in our love to nurture the spark of your precious life. What is on your heart when we sing these words? The imagery of spark might call to mind any number of things. Spark can be a poetic way to call attention to something that words can't really express. So maybe later you'll want to try to capture it with paint, as Stephanie noted, or with music, as so many up here find aliveness in. Or maybe push-ups, maybe so many push-ups that you just, <laughs> it's, it's there. Whatever it is, whatever it takes to bring it into focus, um, to get in touch with that spark. Maybe it's by smiling at someone in a non-creepy way. <laughs> or maybe pinching yourself, whatever it takes. But for now, I have words, so I'll use them imprecisely. And I'll note that the spark of our precious lives might be our spirit or soul or creative life force. The spark I hope to reignite in myself and in others might be a sense of agency, a sense of purpose, a sense of belonging. When we think of nurturing the spark of a particular person, we have the opportunity to be more specific than that. So picture in your mind right now someone younger than you or maybe someone older than you. And with this particular person in mind, you can probably identify something, some quality in them, some spark of potential. which now, in November 2023, what is that in that person? What is that spark of potential in that particular person in this particular moment? Picture that in your mind. Probably can't be put into words. And there's a good chance that, that it's too hard for that particular person to recognize it also. So let's just take a moment to imagine that spark in that person and imagine nurturing, nurturing that spark. Now let's imagine not someone older or younger, but somebody born on the same day as you, in the same place, from the same mother. <laughs> I think you know who I might be talking about. Visualize some spark of potential in that person. This is your own spark your own light, and you are responsible for it. How are you going to take care of it? What skills do you need to brush up on in order to make the most of it? And you're an adult now. Others have nurtured you along the way, and hopefully they will again and again, but you too, have the capacity and the responsibility to nurture the spark of your own precious life. Imagine doing that now, just for a moment. Now, of course, you'll have plenty of time afterward and in the week to come to think about that 
to claim humble ownership of your own gifts. But for now, let's return again to those who have nurtured us along the way. Because when it's hard to recognize our own potential, it can be helpful to reflect back on what somebody else might have seen in us at some point along the way. So think about someone else who has rekindled in you the warmth of love, the fire of truth, the spark of imagination. Not just someone who encouraged you in broad, generic terms like, here's a trophy for participation. No, somebody who really nurtured your spark at that time with your interests and your needs and your, your unique abilities. Maybe it was someone older than you or younger than you, a stranger or a friend. Probably it wasn't someone who gave you perfect advice. And it's probably not someone who fixed you. More likely someone who served as a model or asked the right question at the right time. Stephanie and I are going to come around now with microphones and invite you to share an anecdote. Please, if possible, make it an anecdote, not a general philosophical thing. And keep it to maybe 30 seconds, because I'd like to hear a number of people. Um, and if you're, if you're someone who usually raises your hand right away, hold off if you're somebody who doesn't usually raise your hand right away. Who are you, you people who don't usually raise your hand? <laughs> Let's... Um, it can also be things that you do, a specific thing you do that nurtures your own spark. Singing with this choir and making quilts for the needy. When I was an undergrad student, I had no idea. When I was an undergrad student, I had no idea what I was going to do until I took this one class called Animal Behavior. And the professor there looked at my first exam and saw something in that, those essays. And she took me on as her student, and I stayed as her student for many, many years and got a PhD with her. Finding someone to explore the greater world with. name is Sue. <laughs> um, when I was kind of between high school and college, a, a judge, uh, I must, must have had a connection to them through the Unitarian Church in Boise, Idaho, and he asked my opinion. Actually, I was away in college. He wrote me a letter and said he likes to get different opinions for, before he rules on a case, and he wrote and asked my opinion on a case. I'll never forget it. Two names. Uh, Zach, you don't know him, and uh, Bruce, you don't know him. They're very, very wild dancers, and they are my, although they don't know it, they're my mentors in my dancing. To have been a part of the education of the Tamil children in the village school in India, where I have been associated for 30 years. I'm remembering 20 years ago, I was a teacher at Northwest Indian College and the president, Cheryl Crazy Boy, saw something in me and she asked me to be the academic dean, which is scary as can be. Oh. And um, I'm so appreciative. 
Thank you. I did one of the scariest things I've ever done in my life, which is to take up learning the cello at the age of 70. And my <laughs> thanks go to my cello teacher, Coral, who despite all my wrong notes and, and <laughs> embarrassing efforts is very encouraging. Um, I remember as a youth, um, not finding any place among my peers um, where I fit in. But finally, I found my place at Girl Scout camp in the summers. And some of the things that the counselors wrote in my autograph book, um, you know, nurtured me and sustained me. I remember one counselor writing, I had found her sitting by the lakeside by herself near sunset. And I just came over and sat down next to her and we watched the sunset. And she wrote in my book about I was maybe one of the only campers who could just sit with her in silence and watch the sunset. Another, another counselor had written, who probably could see somewhat of the future me in the child me, and just wrote, dare to be. And I appreciated that. Um, it's, it's funny that I'm sitting here next to Henry, because I haven't been here in a long time. But in 2016, I walked out with Henry after service, and we were standing out there, and Miley came over, and I started talking to Miley, and Becky Curtis and Sue Saig started talking to Henry. And all of a sudden, the three of them turn around and go, you, mentor for coming of age. <laughs> I have two. Um, in 2008, after pleading with spirit, send me something that is going to sweep me off my feet and impassion me, and that will be uniquely mine to some form of expression. About uh, two weeks later, I got this vision um, compelling me to paint, and I'd never painted in my life, since kindergarten maybe, finger painting. And it was, I was walking around my living room. I gotta paint this, I gotta paint this. I don't have supplies, I don't have materials, but I gotta paint this, it's big. Within 20 minutes, two phone calls, I found, the, I didn't want anyone's input, I didn't want direction, I just needed space and materials. And within 20 minutes, two phone calls, I found the perfect person, she said, come on down, I have a studio, I'll give you the materials, you just be and do what you need to do. And I've been painting ever since. And oh, the second one was, I had a, a coach, a mentor who said to me, Susan, you have no idea what's available when you follow through on your commitments. And I really took that to heart because I was someone who would quit things, you know? And so now when I come up against it and I want to quit, I hear his words. Sure, one more, yeah. I stuttered very badly as a child, and um, sometimes when I was an adult, if I'm nervous, I stutter also. And I was in graduate school, and the teacher said, the professor said, um, would I like to be a TA? I said, I can't be a T TA, I stutter. And he said, I don't care if you stutter. I, can you teach math? <laughs> Oh, and there are many more. And I hope over coffee hour, you share with each other some more of these beautiful stories. Thank you. Yes, thank you for sharing. Um, I'm gonna invite Jane to talk now for a minute about our relationship with our partner church in Meyer Sabat, Romania. So the Unitarians in Hungary, Romania, Transylvania, 400 some years ago had the courage to become something that didn't exist before, knowing that there was a spark within 
their Christian tradition, which if, if infused with a little bit more freedom or a lot more freedom, might be something that they would want to carry on into the future, and they have for 400 years. We don't have institutional roots in them, but we definitely have been inspired by their courage and tenacity over all these years, and I'm glad that we can continue to be inspired by them. Good morning. I am here to ask for your contributions to our yearly collection for our partner church in Microsovac, Romania. This village is square in the middle of Transylvania, which has a long history, as Paul has just said, of religious tolerance. With conversion from Catholicism to Unitarianism recognized in 1568. The area is poor, with many living as they have 200 years ago, but they are catching up in the way that suits them. We call this texting while driving. So our partner church goes back as far as 2014 and more. In 2017, about 40 buff members and friends, including Kevin and many choir members, traveled to Magyarsovac with much generosity and hospitality from our partners, the members of Unitarius Templum. Perhaps you recognize some. Through the, oh, and last August, their retiring minister, his wife, Kato and Tomasz Balaj, came to visit us. Through the years, our collection has provided funds for strengthening the foundation of that beautiful old and very old church, many repairs inside and out, and for the general functioning of the congregation and the funds are used as the congregational members see fit and are received with much thanks. During our 2017 visit, they were pleased to show their visitors all that our donations had provided for. In closing, I ask you to give generously. Thank you. Thanks, Jane. And as the ushers come around, um, any cash that you put in the basket will go to Meyer Sabat. If you write out a check, make it out to Buff and in the memo line, um, write Partner Church. If you specifically want it, a uh, check to cover your pledge, um, write that in the memo line. And if you're on Zoom, there will be a slide that shows you how you can contribute as well.
Thank you for that, Melanie. I, I heard in, in the Shenandoah, I was envisioning the sparkling river and I thought of the Bellingham Bay and all the waters around here and, and the sparkle just seemed to tie so well into what we're doing today. I want to thank you for all your generosity to Buff, to the Unitarian Church of Meyer Sabat, and in all that you do in the wider community to fulfill the work of the mission of this congregation. Please come to coffee hour afterward to continue our conversation and continue to build community. If you're on Zoom, please stay after to introduce yourself to one another. As you go downstairs for um, coffee hour, our upscale rummage sale continues this morning. The organizers have selected a curated group of items that they want to offer. So there was a lot there yesterday, but there's a little bit left, the very best of the best, um, <laughs> that, were, that was too good to donate elsewhere. So please come visit our sale downstairs and thank you to the large crew of volunteers who put this together, to Drew Betts for organizing it all. <laughs> and to all of you for donating the things that we bought, for buying the things that were donated and for reusing and uh, making sure things didn't go into the landfill, but found ways to continue on in their lives. Uh, one last thing, we have a Thanksgiving potluck coming up. So please join us if you uh, don't have other plans on Thursday, uh, Thanksgiving Day. There's more uh, details in our uh, midweek update newsletter, which you can find at buff.org. And now, quiet song to take us back out into the world. Having returned to the spark of our own precious lives and renewed by the nurturing earth, the nurturing that we do in our own giving and receiving, let's re-enter the spiral of awe. This is, this is hymn 10, 11, 1, 0, 1, 1, and here with the notes, which will help you because it's one of those two-part things, similar to how we did Stake A Aldash. So the first part, let's sing with Barbara, and then um, the second part with me. So let's do the first part twice, second part twice, and then you get to choose. <laughs>
Return to the world now. Bring your love, bring your good spirit, bring your warmth and your truth and your light. And let's join together as we circle around for freedom. We have a lot of people, so let's make an inner circle and an outer circle. More people in the inner, there's a lot of people in the outer. 